So we're thrilled to have Reid Hoffman with us uh, this morning, and uh, thrilled that we could work it despite a very intense schedule. Uh, so I want to begin uh, by uh, giving you a little bit of a sense of the, uh, of the career trajectory that, that Reid has taken. Uh, he went to a different, he grew up largely in Berkeley, and um, uh, went to a different university, one in Northern California, and it's across the bay. <laughs> that other uh, one. And I can't remember the name, but, yes. uh, uh, but there you are. Uh, but he got a, uh, a Marshall uh, Fellowship to go study uh, philosophy at Oxford, philosophy of mind, uh, and you did that. And yet here you are, uh, CEO of LinkedIn, uh, well. Chairman. Chairman, that's right, <laughs> things change. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but one of the most uh, uh, dynamic, uh, innovative, and thoughtful uh, leaders of, of new ways of thinking about technology and new ways of thinking even about philosophy and the social. And we'll get to that uh, shortly, and we'll have some time for uh, questions from you as well. But how did you get from the philosophy of mind to <laughs> yes. the mind of LinkedIn? <laughs> um, so when I uh, left uh, Stanford, um, I had decided that my goal was to strengthen public intellectual culture within the United States. And what that is, is uh, who are we as individuals in a society and who should we be? It isn't necessarily scholarly, uh, but I thought academics might be the path, so I went to Oxford to study philosophy, uh, partially because my undergraduate was in this program called Symbolic Systems, which is Artificial Intelligence and Cognitive Science. Uh, and I actually concluded that people actually didn't know what a good theory of mind or a theory of, of language was, and so perhaps philosophy would know that. And what I realized was that the thing that attracted me, and I'm still on this mission for strengthening public intellectual culture, uh, it's one of the reasons I come to events like this, because you guys are, 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 are a central part of that, um, is uh, that I cared about how uh, humanity evolves at scale, how the discourse evolves, how the patterns of how we do culture, identity, communication, and uh, I uh, was wary that a philosophical academic path uh, might not be the best way to actually, in fact, get to millions to hundreds of millions of people. And so I had realized by, by the sheer luck of having gone to school here in Silicon Valley was that actually software entrepreneurship uh, could be that path because creating uh, these kind of patterns by which people uh, can uh, create their worldview, their Weltanschauung, uh, based on uh, how they interface with software, how they organize the world, how they identify other people, uh, how they communicate with those people, and uh, powering that with essentially a business model that evolves the, uh, the, the, the tools and the, uh, the medium of participation that they can exist in that can make huge differences in their lives. Uh, and so I would had the, uh, the fortune of, of doing some stuff with the internet uh, prior to its commercialization. And I thought, okay, this is the kind of thing that actually could make a very big difference. And what's more, when you connect that to the public intellectual side, you've got one part, the, you know, the kind of McLuhan, uh, the medium is the message, like the medium that you're interacting in, the medium that you're establishing your identity in, the medium that you are doing searches and, and kind of uh, framing a discourse in, uh, but then you also have uh, the question of how you do empowerment for finding information, for finding education, for finding uh, con connections to opportunities. Uh, and that was uh, the path that uh, I left Oxford uh, thinking, okay, this is the path that I'm going to be on. So you've done a lot of different things uh, uh, after leaving Oxford, but, uh, but just to, to push you a little bit more in this, in this direction, obviously you were thinking deeply already as an undergraduate about uh, human-machine interfaces, and, uh, and you were thinking about uh, uh, mind, individuals, uh, uh, and, and the like, in relationship to a world of others and a world of machines. And, uh, in a way, that's been your, uh, mm -hmm. your, your constant sort of quest to figure out what those relationships might become in a different moment. Uh, you were recently labeled uh, Network Man by <laughs> Nicholas Lemon of The New Yorker. Who I saw yesterday, by the way. Well, uh, <laughs> a, a good friend, yes. uh, former dean of the School of Journalism at uh, Columbia as well, but, uh, but who, who, who really focused on, um, on the nature of the network as a kind of new way of thinking about society. 
and he was thinking about it, in fact, when he wrote that piece, as I think you know, yep. uh, while also thinking about the decline of the corporation and the decline of certain kinds of institutions, yes. or rather the transformation, perhaps, of yep. these institutions. So I'd like you to say a little bit more about you know, yeah. a network from the point of view of being network man. Um, so uh, another good book, uh, Joshua Cooper Ramo published a book this year called The Sixth Sense, basically saying you need to have a network sense. Uh, and I think that is the notion that actually, in fact, being part of the networked age, uh, every object is partially identified by its network position. And you have to look at networks as the way that things transform. It's part of the reason why things move fast. It's part of the reason why um, if you actually look at any particular strategy of any scale, you're actually looking at a network strategy. Uh, and part of that is to think about uh, kind of the questions around uh, how is it, for example, when you think about like our students, you have to think about how are you putting your students in a network? Uh, does that network enable their economic opportunity? Does that network enable future learning opportunities? Uh, does that network enable uh, the kind of uh, uh, civil citizen that you also want to create, which is also part of education? And part of uh, teaching them about networks, I actually uh, wrote a book called The Start of Review, which has one chapter on this, uh, which was the commencement speech, the elaboration of the commencement speech I gave to my high school, uh, is to think about uh, how you position yourself in a network um, is key for how you think about progress in your life. And most people say, oh yeah, I have a cell phone, I do that. That's actually not really the thing. So for example, if you start thinking about how you position yourself in a network, it's, uh, it's, it's a position of serendipity. It's where do network connections lead me to information signals or to opportunities that might find me? It's not only outbound search, Right, so frequently people think about this as, you know, obviously part of the idea that underlies LinkedIn is to say, well, it isn't just searching job listings, it's the ability for an opportunity that is perfect for me to be able to find me. That is not only true in economics, that's true in everything else as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what you begin thinking about when you think about networks. Now how that transforms things like work is that no longer do you think about only as a corporation, as only the people inside the building. Actually, in fact, there are, in any company, there are many more smart experts outside your organization than inside. You hopefully have a number of them inside, but that ability to go tap that expertise is part of what allows you to make a decision faster, more on target, and with less risk. And when you have the increasing time cycle that happens in the modern age, happens in the networked age, that is critical for succeeding either as an individual or as an organization. And so you need to have a network strategy as part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now the theme of this conference is uh, world-class universities and yeah. the public good. And there are leaders and uh, senior administrators from universities all over the globe mm -hmm. who have gathered here together in Berkeley for this. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the reasons we come is to have these discussions and have the opportunity to listen to you talk. And another reason, of course, is at the same time to network. Uh, because we know that uh, indeed there are uh, uh, very talented people, not just in our own institutions, and they're thinking about many of the same things. We had an earlier panel this morning where we were talking about some of the differences uh, between and among uh, national contexts for public higher education. But, uh, but you, you've thought a lot about the university and have in a way been of the university all your life. Uh, what do you think is going to become new in the way we think about the networks that students, let's begin with students, mm. um, uh, uh, take away from universities but also bring to universities as a set of new expectations about what education is all about? So I think, let's see, so something that's obvious to all of us is that the old industrial model of education, which is you have a period of education and then you go out and then work the rest of your life or anything else, that's changing. Uh, skill sets are changing, industries are changing. You have to have what you know, frequently referred to as lifelong learning, although that may be also kind of microcosm on demand. You want to uh, prep, obviously, uh, not only is it kind of, oh, I have a capability of learning new school skills, but you want to uh, have essentially network literacy. So you want to essentially say, okay, how do I, it's a networked age, how do I navigate that network in a way that I continue to learn, that I connect with good opportunities, that I'm a good citizen, that I have a fulfilling life. And, and so part of your setup isn't just like, okay, you know, did I impart skill X right, in class Y? 
you know, calculus or ability to write a, uh, a, 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 a good comparing, a, a compare and contrast or other essay. I think what you want to do is you want to say, all right, how do I have the person be able to continue to identify the sources of information and the sources of skills as they go through the rest of their life? Now, some of that will require checking back in to certain kinds of, of educational institutions. We will, of course, still need to create those. You know, LinkedIn is doing this within the professional arena. We, we uh, purchased a thing called um, uh, Linda, a company called Linda. Many universities have it. It's focused on work skills. A part of that is also to have learning paths which help uh, change career trajectories. Uh, but what you need to think about is think about how do I orient these students into networks. So for example, classically, one of the pieces of advice, you know, what color is your parachute, you know, discover your passions, that is radically insufficient now. It's where, where are you connecting into networks? Are those networks the kind of things that you will find rewarding that will lead you on a career trajectory? And so for example, you know, one of the uh, key things that people frequently forget is to say, well, we would like to have a vibrant alumni network. But part of an alumni network is, is a two-way street. It's not just a broadcast. It's not just send them, a, send them a set of messages. It's a facilitation for how they interact with each other. Now, obviously, universities have done this with class notes for a while. But you know, to some degree, like class note participation is going down because things like Facebook create this in an ongoing way uh, for everyone. And so, um, so the key thing is to think about what is this form of network literacy that we can amplify? And you can even get it to when you're thinking about, OK, I'm teaching these specific classes. What are the ways that I teach these classes in which network literacy is a subtext to it? Just as, for example, you might be teaching a, uh, you know, a great uh, drama course or a great uh, literature course, and you're teaching essays, uh, but you're also teaching writing, you're teaching critical thinking. Network literacy is in that category as well. Interesting. You know, we were talking earlier uh, today about uh, you know, how to think about how we train our students uh, for specific jobs, how we insist on there being uh, enough general education or enough uh, of a liberal arts kind of component that they learn how to think critically and so on and so forth. But uh, there's obviously a lot of confusion as to what the, what the mechanism is uh, between focusing on something in college and then having a particular kind of job. Hmm. And what you're suggesting here is, uh, I think, um, it has at least two uh, implications for us. The first, that um, no single skill is going to be sufficient, so that would be a waste of both the individual's time and the college or university's time. And secondly, that the insertion in a network uh, that you can both understand and uh, deploy meaningfully is probably going to be one of the single most important skills going forward. Yes. And so um, here's another way to think about that, which is part of the thing to think, like, so part of the networked age is we're also having technological amplification. So you know, think about how quickly we've moved into the smartphone revolution. What are the attributes of the smartphone revolution? So if you went back 30, 40 years, a key portion of IQ was memory. Because it was like, well, I can't go get that information. I have to actually, in fact, have it in store. Well, that doesn't matter as much anymore. What really matters is the ability to find it quickly on your mobile phone, right? Because to be able to resolve truth there is what matters much more than, oh, no, no, I read that book, and I know that I can't get to it right now because it's in my library or that library over there, and, and I know how to, that, that, uh, that's still useful, but it's no longer critical, right? Because it's like, oh, what's the fact of this? Well, you Google it, and you have to learn that kind of skill. So for example, what does search literacy look like? Um, and that's the kind of thing that I mean in terms of, of network literacy, which is the question of, like for example, the, the key questions of when you have this big, wide open field of information, how do you discern truth? Now, as an entrepreneur and inventor, one of the things I think about is how do I build in reputation systems built on networks, right? Some of that's within LinkedIn in terms of how do you uh, position, do you believe this person's skills, and do you think what are they capable of, and so forth, and that's part of how People use LinkedIn for professional circumstances. We obviously need to get to that within information circumstances as well. But no matter how good of mechanisms that, that the entrepreneurs who are building these networks can think about in terms of creating information reputation systems, there will still be the skills of deploying them intelligently, of thinking about like when do you evaluate this is a, this is a good point of view, this is too simple, I need additional information, 
this uh, search result or this use of a, a question and answer service or this use of a network in order to find information or opportunity, that's the right one. Those are all part of network literacy skills. So this has obviously been iterative as technology has developed, smartphones and other things, search uh, capacities and the like, and, uh, uh, and the social and cultural uh, modes of interacting and the like uh, with those. Uh, but you know, you, you're watching new trends in technology. You're seeing things change all the time. How do you see, as it were, the next phase of uh, not just technology, but mm. of human interface with technology around some of these mm. kinds of questions? Well, so. Um, so obviously one of the things that's uh, a heavy focus within society and within Silicon Valley right now is artificial intelligence and data. Uh, part of the question of data is that data allows you to, um, to study outcomes and to be much more efficient. So like for example, the kinds of things that uh, we can now do in much more systematic ways is what kinds of, of learners are people? Are they reading learners? Are they audio learners? Are they visual learners? Uh, you can do adaptive uh, learning techniques. You can actually figure out for these individuals or these sets of people, this is the progression and these are the ways that you essentially teach them. Uh, you can create, uh, the, there will be a lot more created like automated, uh, at least initial grading systems uh, for things that, uh, which among other things will help the students on a faster curve for this because they don't have to wait for that intersection of, well, I have to write an essay, I have to wait for the feedback on the essay. It's all very time intensive process, so I get a very limited thing. You can actually speed up that clock by using technology, and that's part of how this happens. Um, and so all of those kinds of, of, of technological trends are here already. And it's part of the reason why, more or less, when I look at any organization of, say, greater than 20 people, I always ask the question, what's your technology strategy? And a technology strategy is not an IT strategy. It's not, are you using Mac or Windows? It's not that kind of thing. It's, what are the technological tools that are in development now, that will be coming five years from now, 10 years from now, that really change the outcomes of what I'm doing in my work and what I'm trying to do as results? And so um, all of those things are, are deeply possible uh, here. And you know, ultimately, you know, part of the reason why you have to have this network sense well, you have to have a kind of a, a, what I referred to in the book Startup of You as permanent beta, which is this kind of continual learning um, uh, capabilities, is because you know, the workplace is going to be changing. Uh, you know, the, the interesting question isn't when uh, there's going to be self-driving cars. Uh, actually, in fact, the technology today, if you took all the human drivers off the road, you could do it with the technology today, and it would be 90% safer six times or more the throughput on the current infrastructure. Uh, the interesting question is when humans driving cars will actually be something that will be for golf, you know, golf courses and kind of equivalent, not for streets. Uh, and, and so that means, of course, that there will be a big transition in labor forces, right? There's a lot of people who are employed driving today. And you know, part of a healthy society is having ways that you can meaningfully participate in your community that not only do you uh, uh, have means of making money, but you have means of, of feeling like you are a, a, an important contributor, you, that you have a job, that, you, you, that you're important in, 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 in the society. And so we have to do all that. And part of what we need to do, both as educators and as, as technologists, is we have to create the mechanisms by which those transformations happen in as a productive me means as possible. Well, I was going to ask you how this uh, all might change the student experience, but let me uh, go right to where you were uh, uh, speaking just now. Uh, I mean, are you envisioning a world in which uh, uh, universities might have as one of their primary obligations figuring out a different kind of structure of work, of play, of participation, of, uh, uh, of, of individual relationships to a very different kind of economy? Well, I think it's... Um one of the important rule, like I think it's both entrepreneurs and universities. So the benefit on the university side is you take some super smart people and you say, okay, you know, uh, think freely, think broadly, hopefully think out of the box, although you know, breaking the canon is always a challenge in any institution. Um, and, and entrepreneurs, it's build new businesses, you know, build new products and services. Uh, try to build the means that will make this happen. And uh, both groups, I think, are going to be important for solving this problem, because uh, the key question is: is actually, in fact, we're going to have a you know, um, you know, the science fiction future is robots are doing all the work, and 
and so forth. And I actually think that that's way too simple-minded. Uh, it's not to say that there won't be, for example, a universe of self-driving vehicles where um, actually, in fact, that will be better for all of us. But then other jobs will begin created, the kind of classic economics. But what do those work patterns look like? What is the transition to those work patterns? What are the skills that are necessary for that flexibility, for that sort of creation? Some of that comes from us, right, as entrepreneurs. Some of that comes from LinkedIn, right, because we kind of do these things like learning, like uh, career paths and, and kind of like what are the bundles of skills and which skills are going up and down uh, within different regions and different companies and different workforces, you know, all that sort of thing. So we contribute that uh, as part of it. Uh, we have this thing called the LinkedIn Economic Graph where you're studying some specific stuff within LinkedIn cities, but it's also the role of universities to be thinking about uh, how is it that we transform? Because one of the things that's the truth about going into the future is no organizations are static, right? Like, the, you, you have to evolve in order to continue to do your mission. It's true of corporations, it's true of governments, it's true of universities. And so that evolution is critical. So. Let me ask you, uh, how do you think, at least in the uh, short to medium term, mm -hmm. term, universities should begin to change? Well, um, you know, uh, part of, uh, one of the way, the tools that I look at these things always is I say, okay, what are the current tools of technology? How do I deploy them? So, for example, how can I get a variety of, of, of different points of data in a digital form such that I can study them with essentially data science? And how can I look at that in terms of, of, of outcomes? Um, you know, part of the thing that obviously we are working towards, we're not, I don't think, uh, we don't think I have enough coverage for this yet in LinkedIn, but is to be able to go back and say, well, you know, with people who had these kinds of degrees, uh, this is the kind of career trajectory that they ended up with, and here's what the patterns of regularity look like. Yeah. You actually would ultimately like that to get down to actually courses and specific skills and other kinds of things. You'd like to get to that level of granularity in order to know that. Um, one of the things that I, as this kind of mapping of technical strategy, that I uh, wrote an essay a couple years ago, maybe it was four or five, uh, called Disrupting the Diploma, and a way of looking at it is say, well, classically the diploma is like, oh, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in symbolic systems. That is not a very uh, information-rich <laughs> document. What if you reimagine this as a network document where you said, well, actually, in fact, I have a set of skills that are plugged in from different kinds of experiences, everything from the things, I, the specific work I did uh, as an undergraduate in courses, in internships, and other kinds of things, to classes, uh, to, to work experience that I had, to certifications I had later, and you had this uh, much richer uh, document that essentially had a much uh, more detailed set of my skills. Well, in that case, uh, employment opportunities become much easier to match to. Uh, the ability to give me information about saying, well, actually, in fact, if you added these two skills to your set, all of these new opening jobs in this industry, because these tracks of which jobs are are, are becoming uh, much more numerous, much more prosperous, much more interesting. Those also become available to me. And so, you know, part of the question is to say, well, how do I plug into that? How do I take that sort of approach to how I'm thinking about what are the skills and capabilities? And, I, and by the way, I'm emphasizing economic here, but obviously that's not the only function. Civic responsibility, personal, aesthetic, ethical, all of these matter in these, in these contexts. And then, as I was saying earlier, is to not think about it as, you know, um, you know I'll, I'll, I'll be deliberately super simplistic. Well, I teach you some math, I teach you some reading and writing, I teach you some analysis and off to the races, but where do you put this person within a network? How do you formulate that network in a way that has them have a transformative life? Uh, and by the way, that's not just the institutions, it's the role of faculty members, it's the role of staff, it's the role, like, how, how do you, how do you cohere towards that goal? And those would be the kinds of things that I would be looking at were I in one of your jobs. Yeah, well, you know, we all know universities are notoriously difficult to, to change. Yeah. Uh, and they're very resistant and, and for all sorts of reasons, some problematic, some good. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but one of the places, of course, that we get most concerned is when you start thinking about the credentialing process, you start thinking about the diploma. Brand is all about, at some level, um, what is affixed on that diploma and what that yeah. will mean. Uh, and it probably means more than what you actually studied when you were doing symbolic systems at Stanford. 
as you know. Yes. Um, what and how do you think uh, some of this will, in fact, however, begin to, to shift uh, the way universities not only organize curriculum, uh, but interact with each other. I mean, let me ask you a kind of networking question around how universities might be able to, both across universities and across universities and corporations and other uh, institutions within the private sector. Well, the central thing that I was arguing for in terms of disrupting the diploma, which is the title of the essay, was that the feedback loop, because part of these things in networks, you have feedback loops, the feedback loop needs to happen also within industry, uh, feeding back information into the public universities or universities, universities yeah. uh, in order to say, look, these are, here's what the trends are, uh, are changing, here's what the skills are, here's what career paths look like, here's the best way that you could actually, in fact, like prepping students in these kinds of ways with these skills, these non-cognitive skills, et cetera, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that lead to success, lead to happiness, uh, lead to good civic participation. And, um, and there's probably some kind of, I haven't really thought about that. I mean, this is obviously natural for the, an institution like this. What does what the cross university look like? Now, uh, classically, it would be like, well, um, what's the ability to c create a collective data platform such that we're all inputting data and learning from the aggregation of that data in terms of um, these are the kinds of different um, learning experiences are, these are the kinds of different outcomes, these are the better ways to do education, these are the better ways to um, have trajectories of ongoing learning as they leave the institution. Um, those sorts of things. I also think that, you know, one of the, the there's obviously uh, some good things about a concept of ivory tower, but I think it's actually much more important to actually have uh, connectivity. So one of the things that I did as a student uh, at Stanford is I actually realized in the symbolic systems program that uh, we, uh, they, they created the program in part because they were trying to figure out what the methodology of symbolic systems should be. They realized that there were these similar tools in philosophy and linguistics and computer science and psychology and philosophical logic, and they all had these patterns of symbol systems, but they didn't actually really know what to do. And I realized that one of the things that made it, uh, that needed to make it more concrete for students is I created a weekly lecture series called the Symbolic Systems Forum by which we would bring in people from industry, from the think tanks, from outside of, of, of the academy to talk about how their work related to the kinds of studies that we were doing. So that you'd begin to see this kind of pattern. And that was a, I didn't realize at the time, was a form of network formation. Right. And you could see a similar form of network formation across universities, potentially. Um, like you could see that that wasn't just a, like the, 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 the problem that I was trying to solve was how do you have because networks is mutually beneficial relationships when they work. How do you have good networks with the rest of Silicon Valley and Stanford was the thing. But also, of course, how you do that across universities. There is undoubtedly something there if, it, if someone put their thinking cap on and you know, gave it some thought. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in, in some ways, many of these things are beginning to happen, in part because mm -hmm. students and faculty live in this world and are thinking about new kinds of opportunities. And there are, indeed, ivory tower uh, metaphors notwithstanding uh, uh, many forms of porosity uh, uh, inside and outside the university. But of course, one of the things that we worry about uh, is what the funding model is going to be going forward. Uh, one of the reasons why we're concerned about uh, uh, some forms of change that might you know, break down the, not just the, uh, the institution of the university itself, but the uh, uh, the particular kind of strong uh, affiliation that a student has with a single institution, mm -hmm. which we're of course expecting them to maintain yeah. for the rest of their lives, yeah. uh, is that we were going to be relying on them first as uh, yes. paying tuition, or then you know advocating for taxpayer support, and also then of course coming back as philanthropists. Yep. Um, it's not your job, <laughs> but um, do you think the funding model of universities is going to have to also change in big ways? Um, Possibly, maybe, probably. Um, I mean, I'm, uh, despite having uh, gone to Stanford, I'm a great fan of public institutions. I think it's really important. Uh, it's part of the reasons why I uh, come to events like this one. Uh, and, uh, and so I do think that there is a value on, you know, still, you know, public funding. Uh, but I do think that, uh, one of the things that is a more or less rule of scale 
is scale is directly correlated with business models. And so if you uh, have, uh, like one, I'll make a bit of a personal story on this. So when I was going through Stanford and Oxford, I had what I will self-describe as kind of a classic you know, elite academic snobbishness towards business. I was like, oh yeah, that's simple-minded. I, I do all this abstraction. You know, this is me, I'm not claiming this of anyone else, but I was like, I, I'm capable of all this abstraction and this business world is just simple. And uh, I was very happy in my first couple years uh, going into the business world because I started realizing that I personally was simple-minded and that I actually, in fact, had uh, not sufficiently appreciated how much the uh, the economic OS that underlines all of society, and that these patterns of how this economic you know, operating system, sorry, Silicon Valley jargon, <laughs> uh, 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 is, is actually, in fact, thinking about how that substrate works is fundamental to getting all the other uh, virtues that you want. You want great education, you want healthcare systems, you want whatever else, so you have to think about the, the economic OS, and that means thinking about the business models of particular organizations or particular institutions within that. And so um, while it normally feels anathema to folks who are missionaries and visionaries in scholarship, in research, you know, in education, because they go, oh, that's a little icky, actually, in fact, thinking about healthy business models is a very useful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, know, you can say, well, we can think about our existing business models, which you know, is anything from tuition uh, to public funding to alumni and philanthropic gifts, to foundation and research gifts, and we can think about how to take those economic streams and how to improve them. Because business models, by the way, refine. You say, what are the ways that we can still meet our mission and also have improved business models? That is actually, in fact, productive thought, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, scale only happens through effective business models, right? And, and for example, this is one of the things that people most frequently misunderstand about Silicon Valley, partially because we say the wrong story, we say, oh, we're technology inventors. Actually, we're technology business inventors. Technology is invented in many different places. Part of what makes Silicon Valley very unique is we do the mashup between technology and business models, and we do that exceptionally well. A similar kind of thing when you're thinking about educational outcomes is, how do I align this with a business model in something that works effectively? Now, that can be an amplification of the, of the current ones, or it can be new ones, and that's, that's one of the, the you, you think it's like, ah, oh, that's the other thing. It's like, no, no, actually, in fact, for a mission of scale, that's really essential to make it work. So I absolutely agree that uh, we in universities can learn more from our, uh, our partners in, 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 in the world of business, mm -hmm. precisely around thinking through what the business model uh, uh, requires as us to think about in terms of really sustaining all that goes on in the university. At the same time, some of what we want to sustain is, uh, is, is distinctly of the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we've been talking about is how to preserve uh, you know, the kind of curiosity-driven uh, part of, yep. uh, of university life, whether it's in the sciences or whether it's in the arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, what we need then is a business model for something that is a little bit at an angle mm -hmm. to business itself. Yeah. And if we don't have both sides of that, we're probably going to fall down the crack in the yeah. middle. But, uh, well, and, and that, that, that's a very good, gentle reminder. I'm not saying the university should be focused only on its business model. I'm saying no, you need the I business model in order to achieve the other goods that are the primary mission. So we can look to the private sector to help us think these th things yeah. through. But increasingly, of course, there is an interest in looking to the private sector for more kinds of support for uh, individual students yeah. and potentially for, for research or, for that matter, for sustaining some of the things that are very hard to support, like the arts and culture and so on. Yep. Uh, is that something, do you think, the, the, the private sector is going to be responsive to? So I think you have a, a bit of a kind of collective action problem, mm -hmm. um, which I'm not entirely sure how to solve, right? I, it's not that I, you know, entrepreneur, I'm inherently optimistic. I tend to think every problem is ultimately soluble. Some of them are super hard, though. And the, the frequent issue is, is to say that businesses are most often competing with each other. And so the allocation of their capital and resources is to create a differential advantage to how they bring product and service to the market. So for example, helping teach, um, you know, contribute to education where those folks might go anywhere, right, and be benefiting competitors and other people is equally as them, it usually tends to be a, 
uh, an inefficient use of capital and inefficient use of resources. So the problem you have is you go to each one of these institutions and you say, or businesses and you say, well, you contribute. They say, well, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be helping all the other folks. I want to be figuring out something for myself. Right. So you need to figure out that collective action problem. Now, whether or not that's getting a group of them together, whether or not that's a, uh, a, um, an NGO or a government uh, you know, coordination effort, uh, because they do, you know, businesses do rely upon universities to pr produce you know, uh, driven, intelligent, curious, skilled folks who want to go into the kinds of jobs they want to create. And so that coordinative function is extremely important. But if you go to each one individually, they'll go, well, I don't want to be contributing to my comp like the industry success. I need to be investing capital for myself. So it's a, it's a coordination problem. Uh, which I think is soluble, but will take some real work. Well, that's one of our big challenges here, of yeah. course. Uh, 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 last question, then I'm going to open it up. But mm -hmm. uh, it appears to be the case uh, that if you do a kind of network analysis, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that um, the current political uh, race uh, maps onto, uh, on the one side, a set of networks that probably have universities centrally mm -hmm ensconced in that network, and another set of networks that don't. Mm. This, of course, uh, is part of the uh, whole, uh, uh, I think, imperative behind thinking about training uh, students to be citizens and, uh, and members of civil society and so on and so forth. But it seems particularly urgent. It seems particularly mm. urgent in Britain around uh, 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 certainly what uh, the demographics of support uh, for Brexit were. And it seems particularly urgent right here now. Uh, I'm uh, a nonpartisan university uh, chancellor, but uh, what, what, what am I, I know you think about these things, Reid. So. So, so one of the things I think, look, the, the, we're obviously living in, in a modern version of the 1920s with a certain amount of political instability. And that political instability comes from the fact that there's a wide set of folks who feel that they have been left out of the progress that uh, globalization has promised. Uh, and. Uh, and they worry about their future. And one of the things that behooves anyone who hopes to be a leader in society is to figure out how to help create an inclusive future. So classically in Silicon Valley, this is discussed as what does the future middle class jobs look like? Uh, one of the, the challenges with a network age is does that nat nat naturally lead to you know, essentially uh, power law distributions of economics and power across institutions, across individuals? Uh, what do you do about that, and how do you make sure it's sufficiently inclusive? And so those are the legitimate issues that are underlying some of the, uh, the discontent that's going on both in the Brexit vote and in uh, today's vote. And it's super important uh, that we actually create kind of a broad-based uh, inclusion and also uh, you know, uh, ability to live what I think is really great about the American dream, which is a life of opportunity and prospects, and have that very widely distributed. And so, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, part of what I've been doing over the last few weeks is because I'm a, a, a very strong supporter of Hillary, uh, and I uh, feel that uh, Trump is, well, I think I put, put this on Bloomberg on Monday, uh, somewhere between the disaster and terrible. Um, the. Uh, the key thing, though, is to understand the nature of the time and what we do about it structurally. Because presuming that, as I hope, uh, Hillary wins uh, in the November election, uh, we still have this challenge of how do we include a wide swath of our citizenry in a future that they feel that has a role for them, has, has a place of pride and meaning, uh, a place of, of, of some economic stability. Uh, and that is that is important for business leaders, it's important for university leaders, uh, and it's important to acknowledge that, that while we can be super frustrated by you know, the backing of you know, um, what, it, what looks uh, like racist claims and other kinds of things, and we can say, we want to leave all of that behind, we also need to address the kinds of things that lead to the discontent, and those things aren't going away in November. Uh, we're still going to be in the middle of them. Indeed. Well. Uh, you've, in, in a way, just uh, restated the whole premise of this conference, which is the need for world-class universities to address the public good in a way that is inclusive and persuasive. So questions from you. There's one here. 
Thank you. My name is Riri Fitrisari from the University of Indonesia. Mr. Hoffman, as an internet entrepreneur and venture capitalist, how do you see uh, university, uh, world-class university in relation to the employability in terms of social uh, selling index that you are thinking of? Or what, you, what was your vision about alternative metrics uh, on, on this? Thank you. So, so metrics by which public universities help for employability, is that the? Right. Um, so part of what I hope to see created, which LinkedIn is trying to operate on, is to give pretty good indices about which kind of skills and which kinds of learning paths uh, create uh, good long-term economic trajectories, both initial and ongoing. And so we already do some of this. We publish some economic graph information. Um, I don't know how much we do relative to Indonesia. My apologies. <laughs> right? I, I don't know how, how, uh, how much is there yet. Uh, we, do, we are uh, doing this deep dive in this thing that we call LinkedIn cities, which is um, we've, we've picked a few cities uh, from the UK thing, including Manchester, <laughs> uh, around the world, uh, although I actually think because we have such a high density in English, although we're working on the rest of it, I think they're all English cities. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's the beginning of a work. Uh, and uh, we're trying to see like, what is the entire skill index of that city and what is the transformation of the industries and what is the transformation of career paths. Now that would obviously tie to the kinds of things you would look at at universities to say, what are the initial kinds of skills that get you into the initial jobs by which you continue to learn uh, going on to that? And how do you actually use that as a detailed thing as opposed to the, well, I'm capable of self-expression, I'm capable of writing, I'm capable of analysis, I'm capable of math. <laughs> right. What is the more detailed things? And I'll give you uh, one uh, thought that I had been trying to figure out how to create both an educational pattern for and a uh, measurement for, which is most work is collaborative. Right? Yet, in order to do assessment, most education tends to be individually assessed. And so how do you actually, in fact, teach collaboration and assess collaboration? Because collaboration is actually key to almost every modern work environment. <laughs> right? So how would you do a dashboard on that? And, and like, for example, the one pattern, just for what it's worth, this was just kind of idle brainstorming, was to say, what if you taught a set of classes where you actually uh, gave only assessment to, to groups, like, say, groups of five, but you recombined it, and then you, the students uh, assessment was the average of all of their groups, right, as a way of getting the how do you do collaboration as part of this. And so anyway, that, that's, that's a, a disordered answer to your excellent question, but those are some, some comments. Yeah, in the back. Hello. Uh, Francisco Cantu, Tecnológico de Monterrey, uh, Mexico. Uh, there are about 8 billion people uh, in the world, uh, half of which have access to internet. That means uh, around 4 billion people. And the average is uh, three devices per person. So that gives you something like 12 uh, uh, million devices connected to, to the internet. So the question is, uh, and these uh, numbers are uh, growing exponentially. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an exponential growth pattern uh, in here. So what is, the, what is your vision of uh, LinkedIn for the next five to, uh, to 10 years in order to take advantage of this growth and the business model behind this in order to you know, remain on the uh, networking era? So um, where we start from is part of how we think about it is the network as a platform where that platform allows you to construct applications. You can think like iOS and apps on top of it. And the apps help you navigate your life. And the kinds of the things that the apps are is feedback of information about, like for example, what opportunities are available to me? What skills should I learn? What are other people who have my background? What kinds of things are they doing? What does progress look like in terms of either you know, salary or economic? And so as we get more and more connectivity, this network as a platform with a set of rich apps on top of it which help me navigate my life should get essentially deeper. And that's the architecture by which we think of this. And so 
how we try to do that is we say, well, how do we get as much people on with a robust network and part of the LinkedIn semantics? Because when you think about the, the network, you think about what are the semantics. And the semantics we try to create as part of the platform is where two people know each other well enough to, on a conditional case-by-case -case basis, recommend each other information, connections to other people, you know, that sort of thing. And so how does that then lead into this uh, exponential increase in density from everyone coming on as, as network? And how does that all lead anything from educational opportunities to economic opportunities uh, to uh, information and truth discovery opportunities? And that's how we, that's the broad scope about how we look at things. Great. We maybe have time for maybe one more question. Yeah. Uh, Les Boroshevich, University of Cambridge. Reed, I can buy into an awful lot that you've said. Um, we've, a university, 800 years, we've evolved or we'd have become extinct. Technology doesn't phase us one jot. The idea of evaluation and the use of technology doesn't cause any problems. The problem I've got is that what you're describing is an evolving system mm -hmm. moving into a predictive environment Whereas I see an environment in 20 to 30 years' time which is chaotic, difficult to predict where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And world-class universities have as their core the identification of individuals who will create ideas that will fundamentally change the world. You know, in Cambridge, everything that you've described, you get a 2-1 for. You get the first where you've actually shown new interpretation of old data in a way which a machine would merely see as an outlier at the present time rather than predict that this is an area of new thinking that needs to develop. Mm. And I want to see what your view would be in terms of incorporating that into the wider system that you're proposing. Um, so... I agree that one of the problems, like the intelligent identification of outliers is key for innovation and progress. We do that precisely within Silicon Valley. So as an investor, you know, which of these thousands of entrepreneurs do I put money and resources behind in order to amplify? So I'm in a very similar thing in the outlier cases. Now, um, and outlier cases are generally speaking not easily identifiable by induction, <laughs> right? So I think that's also the case. That's actually, and, and perhaps just in the brevity of time, uh, I actually frequently don't look for completely automating things. I think driving should be completely automated because I think it, there's a coordination thing that works there. But actually, in fact, it's, it's man-machine combinations. And so it's the use of, like for example, I actually don't think, even though machines today can do radiology better than, than the vast majority of doctors, I don't think you get rid of you know, doctors. I don't think you get rid of radiologists. I think the radiologist uh, skills change to say, look, I'm, I, I'm aware of what kinds of outputs that will come from the AI machine learning techniques that will give me the reading on the radiology, but I'm also aware what the error cases are, where the outlier cases are. And that's where I think the man-machine combination comes into this. So you don't say, oh no, we outsource the identification outliers to the AI techniques, maybe they'll get good enough, maybe they won't, unclear, <laughs> right, like your future. But you use the combination. So having a technology strategy is how do we, as experts, as professionals, uh, how do we use technology to do that kind of outlier identification, not how does it happen automatically and now we can just sit back and watch it happen. That's the kind of pattern that I would look for that. And, um, and it's an excellent question. I mean, I do think it's interesting, you know, part of one last little illustrative thing, I don't know how many people tracked the uh, Google DeepMind, um, which I think are some Cambridge and Oxford folks, uh, did this th program called AlphaGo, which is now currently ranked as the top Go player in the world, and there are more moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe, so it's a difficult to compute problem. But the interesting end result of that game by which uh, they won the top slot is it has revolutionized the field of Go because the program was actually exhibiting creative moves and creative, creative things. And so there is some sort of symbiosis there that I actually think is it's, it's illustrative of something that's, that might be the kinds of things we're looking at when we're identifying outliers. Well, look, join me, please, in thanking Reid Hoffman for a terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah.